crisp. Pleasant good morning to all. Um, I'll read for you today from the 20th division of the psalm. And the word of God says, May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of God, of the God of Jacob, defend you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and strengthen you out of Zion. May he remember you, remember all your offerings and accept your burnt sacrifice. May he grant you according to your heart's desire and fulfill all your purpose. We will rejoice in your salvation and in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They have bowed down and have fallen, but we have risen and stand upright. Save, Lord. May the king answer us when we call. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, today, I stand here and I call upon your name in the behalf of your people. We thank you, God, for your many blessings. And we praise you for the fact that you have sustained us thus far. We thank you and praise you for who we are, for who you are. Today, as we go through today's proceedings, I pray, God, for your blessing upon today's sitting. I pray, God, for the Honorable Premier as he presents his address. I pray, God, for your blessings to fall upon uh, this island. We know that uh, we are going through a difficult time with the global crisis, but we still believe that you are able to provide for our every needs. I pray, God, for the representatives in this honorable house, that you will continue to give them wisdom and guidance as they continue to deliberate on behalf of your people. I also pray for the people of this beautiful island. Dear Lord, you have been with us in the past, and we have the confidence that you will continue to be with us. I pray, God, that you will provide for us, and when it is all said and done, may we give you all the praise, glory, and honor that is due to your holy name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Motion for the approval of the other paper as circulated. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Mr. President, I rise to move a motion for the approval of the other paper as circulated. Mr. President, I rise to second the motion. The question is that the order paper, motion for the order paper circulated be approved. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Messages from the Deputy Governor General. Announcements by the President.
Good, good morning to all. Let me at this time welcome all of you to this honorable house. At this sitting, I also would like to acknowledge the presence of the Honorable Speaker of the House of Assembly in St. Kitts, or the National Assembly, Honorable Michael Perkins, and all other dignitaries in terms of permanent secretaries and supporters of the CCM party. I also would like to indicate that we are ensuring, we have tried to ensure that we adhere to the protocol and that is why we would have had some seats on the outside and the spaces inside is what is desired of us. I beseech each and every one of you to kindly have your cell phones either turned off or the volume turned down. Put it on vibrate as the case may be. I know some time ago I would have said that if anyone whose phone went off would be sent outside. And unfortunately, on that occasion, <laughs> and, and this is not a laughing matter at this time, my phone <laughs> went off. <laughs> and, and that is just a light moment. So, I did not send myself outside. But if it were to happen, I would do so. What I have done is that I have left my phones in my vehicle. I know that technology is such that, that sometimes they behave in a certain way. So, please, and I hope that what I would have said, you take it to heart. Thank you. Papers to be laid. Good morning, Mr. President. <clears throat> um, in my capacity as Premier and Minister of Finance, I would like to lay on the table our estimates of expenditure and revenue for 2021. And whilst I'm on my feet, Mr. President, please also allow me to lay on the table, as is required by law, the report of the Director of Audit for the Audited Public Accounts of the Nevis Island Administration, December 31st, 2019. And I would just like to say, as I lay this, that this administration has ensured that we have restored constitutional rectitude to the financial affairs of the Nevis Island Administration. Thank you. Statements by ministers. Personal explanations. Introduction of bill and first reading. Mr. Mr. President, on this occasion, I rise to introduce, and I've read for the first time, the bill shortly entitled the Nevis Appropriation 2021 Ordinance 2020.
Mr. President, I rise to second the motion. The question is that the bill shortly entitled the Navy's Appropriation 2021 Ordinance 2020. We are the first time. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. A bill to appropriate certain sums of money for the use of the public service of the island of Nevis for the financial year commencing on the 1st day of January 2021 and ending on the 31st day of December 2021. The bill has been read the first time. Public business, bill, second and third reading. Mr. President, I rise again on this occasion to move the second reading of the bill shortly entitled Nevis Appropriation 2021 Ordinance 2020. And as is customary, Mr. President, to use this occasion to present the budget address, which sets out in short the plans and projections for the Nevis Island Administration for the fiscal year 2021. Mr. President, it is, Mr. President, an honor and privilege for me this morning to rise and present this budget under the theme, Rebuilding Our Economy, a people-centered approach to economic recovery. <clears throat> there can be no doubt that this fiscal year 2020 will go down as a sad period in global history. It was truly a year in which global economic gains were all eroded within the blink of an eye due to the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. This fiscal year 2020, which initially showed great signs of economic success, especially during the first quarter, was expected to be the best since the economic slowdown of 2007. It is, however, ending shrouded in a cloud of uncertainty. Our tourism, construction, and retail sectors were all showing great signs of recovery, but these economic gains were swiftly eroded by the knock-on effects of the global pandemic. Mr. President, who could have imagined a period where global trade and global transportation could have been brought to such a sudden halt? This pandemic must trigger the global community to rethink the way in which business and trade are generally conducted if we are to weather a similar storm of this nature in the future. We must salute and pay our highest tributes to our frontline and essential workers who have unreservedly risked their own health and well-being and that of their families in the fight against COVID-19. We are humbled and deeply moved by their immense sacrifice unrelenting commitment and indomitable dedication to keep our people safe while we plot our course through to the other side of this pandemic. We hail their noble contribution and efforts in combating this invisible enemy. Like so many of our neighbors, we have had our struggles with destructive natural disasters, debilitating national debt, the scourge of crime and violence, and now this dreaded coronavirus. These challenges have not managed to diminish our successes and triumphs. As an island and a nation, we have always excelled in every facet of human endeavor, and so too we will weather the scourge of this global pandemic. Mr. President, the theme for our recently celebrated 37th anniversary of independence forced us to focus on building resilience, innovation, and security in keeping with the challenges posed during this fiscal year. Somewhat inevitably, therefore, we have settled on a budget theme that focuses on the health and well-being of our people as the core elements essential to rebuilding our economy even while we combat the pandemic. In implementing the measures necessary to defeat the challenges that confront us, we are motivated by the unrelenting spirit of our people and strive to match their determination with unfailing resolve. Mr. President, the post-pandemic year 2021 demands our resourcefulness, our creativity, 
and a profound paradigm shift in our planning perspectives. We recognize, therefore, that we must give focused attention to such matters as the security of our food supply, delivery of efficient and effective health care, modernized delivery of education, economic diversification, and the overall well-being of our beloved Nevis and wider federation. We must continue to take steps to stabilize our economy in the short term, seek to reduce poverty, and sustain our enviable health and education systems while we press forward to build a truly integrated and inclusive society. This can only be achieved through the hard work and discipline of our people, implementation of prudent government policies, and reliance on the solid support of our families and friends across the globe. Even as we await the rebounding of our main economic pillar, the tourism sector, we must continue to incentivize the secondary pillars of construction, financial services, and agriculture, because these sectors can be operationally effective amidst the health protocols while providing a means of reducing our food import bill, enhancing healthy lifestyles, and stimulating economic activity for our people. Mr. President, for those among us who continue to suffer the pain of unemployment and despair caused by the coronavirus pandemic, I want you to know that we share your pain. When you suffer, we all suffer. Ours is a shared struggle. My administration will continue to employ strenuous efforts to assist in cushioning the cruel blow dealt to us all in this crisis. We anticipate with some confidence that the reopening of our borders and the imminent availability of a COVID-19 vaccine will restore some semblance of economic activity in the country and in Nevis over the near term. We must all continue to work together, the public and private sector, civil society, communities and individuals, if we are to be triumphant. Most assuredly, some difficult days still lie ahead for us as the global community battles the second wave of this pandemic. Recovery will be slow, but we must remain vigilant, informed, and committed to exercising every care as we navigate the realities of this changing world. Above all, let us continue to pray ceaselessly for each other and for our beloved island and nation. Mr. President, the World Economic Outlook as published by the International Monetary Fund in June of 2020, termed the current state of world affairs as, and I quote, a crisis like no other, an uncertain recovery. In that report, the IMF predicts that global growth is projected at 4.9% for the remainder of 2020. This is a 1.9% percentage points below its April 2020 forecast. The report further states that the COVID-19 pandemic has had a more negative impact on the activity in the first half of 2020 than anticipated, and that recovery is projected to be more gradual than previously forecast. In the new fiscal year 2021, global growth is now projected at 5.4% and would result in the GDP projected for that year being 6.5 percentage points lower than in the pre-COVID-19 projections of January 2020. Just like in Nevis, the adverse impact on low-income households is particularly acute, imperiling the significant progress made in reducing extreme poverty in the world since the 1990s. The report also noted that the international community must vastly step up its support for global initiatives, including financial assistance to countries with limited health capacity and channeling of funding for vaccine production so that adequate, affordable doses are quickly available to all countries. Moreover, building on the record drop in greenhouse gas emissions during the pandemic, the IMF urges that policymakers should both implement their climate change mitigation commitments <coughs> and work together to scale up equitably designed carbon taxation or equivalent schemes. Additionally, the global community must also act now to avoid a repeat of this catastrophe by building global stockpiles of essential supplies and protective equipment, funding research, supporting public health systems, and putting in place effective modalities for delivering relief to the neediest. Mr. President, even though St. Kitts and Nevis may not have had 
a major role to play in the above listed initiatives as laid out by the IMF. This is sound advice, which must be adhered to by major economies as their inaction will certainly have considerable negative consequences for small island states such as ours. At a regional level, our Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, ECCB, forecasts that the region's economy would shrink 16.2% this year and cautioned that our recovery depends on the continued resilience of our health systems, containment of the COVID-19 virus, availability and access to vaccines, and fiscal and financial support. It was also confirmed at the meeting of the Monetary Council held in October 2020 that the COVID-19 pandemic has had an extremely damaging effect on all ECCB member countries as a result of disruptions in the travel and tourism sector and severe reductions in foreign direct investment. This economic contraction is projected to be uneven across the eight ECCB member states, ranging from 5.5% to as high as 30% with countries that rely heavily on tourism but have limited fiscal space likely to have slower recoveries. As of August 31, 2020, licensed financial institutions in the ECCU reported moratoria on 26,194 loans with an outstanding balance of $5.2 billion, or 39.3% of total loans. The Monetary Council at its October 2020 meeting, also approved the Program of Action for Recovery, Resilience, and Transformation of the ECCU Economies. The proposed program focuses on actions that are fundamental for the recovery, resilience, and transformation of the ECCU, and is guided by the key principles of regional integration and solidarity, sustainable and innovative financing, inclusivity, innovation, and competitiveness. The Council also agreed. The Council also agreed, Mr. President, that collective action among member governments, citizens and residents, regional institutions and development partners is crucial for the successful execution of this program among the economies of the member states of the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union. Mr. President, our economy is very much intertwined with that of the outer world. And therefore, it is against this backdrop and the predictions for the regional and international economies as outlined that we must now shape the recovery and rebuilding process for our own economy over the near term. Mr. President, the fiscal performance of the Nevis Island Administration for the year 2020 to date has been directly affected by the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and the resultant global recession. For the period March to June 2020, our economy was rendered dormant and almost all forms of commercial activity island-wide came to a standstill. The tourism sector in particular has been devastated and its decline has diminished the revenue generating prospects for our administration. Our recovery, therefore, hinges on a successful and sustainable resumption of our tourism sector which is expected to have direct positive spillover effects on all other sectors of our economy, especially positively impacting the level of employment. It is painfully clear that our fiscal position as of October 31, 2020 has weakened in comparison to where we were at the corresponding period in 2019. The total recurrent revenue generated as of 31 October 2020 amounted to $94.26 million, which represents a decrease of some $20.46 million, or 17.84% over the results of the same period in 2019, where the revenue generated at that time was $114.72 million. This recurrent revenue, coupled with the $48.34 million received by the administration from proceeds of the CBI program and other grant funding resulted in an overall total revenue of $142.6 million. Mr. President, 
the tax revenue collected as at 31st October 2020 amounted to $71.4 million, which represents a decline of 18.65% when compared to the same period in 2019, where the amount collected was $87.77 million. The most significant contributor to the tax revenue collected for this period was the value-added tax VAT, which accounted for 24.25% of recurrent revenue. Additional notable contributions included financial services, 9.24%, social services levy, 7.93%, import duties, 7.67%, customs service charge, 6.80%, and stamp duties, 6.74%. The total expenditure, Mr. President, for the period January to October 2020 amounted to $157.06 million, which represents a marginal increase of 3.54% when compared to the outlay of $151.7 million for the same period in 2019. Recurrent expenditure for the review period amounted to $118.91 million, a small decrease of 4.29%, when compared to the outlay of $124.25 million for the same period in 2019. The main components of the period's recurrent expenditure were personal emoluments, which accounted for 53.25%, and the purchase of goods and services, which accounted for 20.04%. Debt servicing, consisting of both principal and interest payments, amounted to some $19.15 million or 16.12% of our recurrent expenditure. Mr. President, for the period under review, the outlay for public investments amounted to $38.15 million, which is an increase of 39% over the amount spent for the period ending 31st October 2019 of $27.45 million. A large portion of this expenditure was allocated to the improvement in our healthcare facilities to deal with the pandemic, along with the retrofitting of our school infrastructure to meet the requirements for the reopening of our schools in the new school term. Our fiscal position for the period January to October 2020 has naturally deteriorated. The fiscal deficit currently stands at $17.69 million which represents a widening of the deficit over its level of $11.76 million for the fiscal year ended December 2019. While our fiscal deficit has worsened by some 50.48% over its level as of December 2019, the primary account surplus has in fact expanded. The primary balance has moved from a deficit of $12.48 million as of 31st December 2019 to a small surplus, Mr. President, of 4.69 million as of 31st October 2020. The CBI transfers received as of October 2020 amounted to $48.34 million, which represents a 97.32% increase over the 24.5 million received in the same period in 2019. Mr. President, our collection of the value-added tax has taken a severe hit since the onset of the pandemic. This is unexpectedly so. This is, I'm sorry, expectedly so, as this tax is driven heavily by the level of services in the economy. The closure of our borders and the resulting close of activities of our tourism sector have naturally caused a damaging effect to our VAT collections, since a large portion of the VAT collected at the domestic level is driven by activities in the hotel and restaurant sectors. During the period January to October 2020, VAT collected at the Inland Revenue Department on domestic services amounted to $11.69 million, a 20.15% decrease when compared to the amount of $14.6 million collected for the corresponding period in 2019. VAT collected at the Customs Department for the similar period in 2020 was 11.16 million, representing a 17.64% decrease when compared to the 13.5 million collected 
for the same period in 2019. Overall, the total VAT generated for the period January to October 2020 therefore amounted to 22.85 million, a significant reduction of 18.94% when compared to the amount of 28.1 million collected for the corresponding period in 2019. This overall reduction of 18.94% in VAT revenue up to October 2020 is a clear indication of the damaging effect of the global pandemic on our local economy. Mr. President, I now turn my attention to the status of our public debt. I wish to report that despite the significant decline in revenue collections in 2020, your government was ever prudent in its expenditure management and was able to limit the extent of any new borrowings. We are grateful to our bankers for allowing us the flexibility to work within our existing overdraft limit to meet the day-to-day -day expenditures of government over the past several months. However, in anticipation of a prolonged post-COVID-19 effect on revenue, my government has negotiated an arrangement with the Bank of Nevis to convert some $20 million of our existing overdraft balance into a long-term loan so as to give us some spending scope within our existing overdraft limit. I wish to make it clear, Mr. President, that this $20 million is not new debt, but merely a conversion of the existing overdraft into a long-term loan, a mere conversion from one form of existing debt to another, but at a low interest rate and therefore a low cost to service. I must also report that in response to the increasing need for housing for our people, our government has negotiated a special financing arrangement with the First Caribbean International Bank in the amount of $1.77 million to purchase some 9.63 acres of land at Morden Estate and Ramsbury. These lands will be subdivided and resold to residents of Nevis. It must be noted that this is a short-term financing arrangement and successful applicants will be required to seek their own financing as all monies received from the sale of the subdivided plots will go directly to paying down the balance on this loan. Therefore, we expect that this loan will be repaid in full as soon as all the lots are sold. My administration will meet the interest payment on this facility from our consolidated resources, and we have made adequate provision for this payment in our budget for the upcoming fiscal year. However, we continue to draw down on loan facilities which were already approved prior to the onset of the pandemic. These include the 1.9 million disbursement on the Taiwanese loan for the small business micro lending project, 7 million drawdown on the social security loan previously approved for the funding of capital projects, including the completion of works on the hospital rehabilitation project, and also moderate fluctuations in our overdraft balance to finance government operations for this fiscal year. Meanwhile, the Nevis Electricity Company, Nevlek, continued to draw down on pre-approved loan funding from the Caribbean Development Bank and the Nevis Housing and Land Development Corporation continued to access pre-approved funding from the St. Christopher and Nevis Social Security Board <clears throat> to fund its housing program on Nevis. Therefore, Mr. President, the total central government debt as of October 31, 2020 stood at $427.79 million, an increase of 3.63% when compared to the amount of $412.91 million as of December 2019. This increase of approximately $14.88 million is already outlined above and represents drawdowns on various facilities which were already approved prior to the onset of the pandemic. Of this, the domestic debt of $390.83 million represents 91.36% of all debt, while the foreign debt amounts to $36.96 million, or 8.64%. When we combine the central government debt as of October 31, 2020, with debt of our statutory bodies and other NIA guaranteed debt, 
This gives a total public sector indebtedness of $481.54 million, an increase of 4.35% when compared to the public sector stock of debt of $461.46 million as of December 2019. We will always endeavor to keep our indebtedness in check and seek out low cost or concessionary financing whenever there is a need to incur new debt. This forms part of our overall debt strategy aimed at keeping our annual debt servicing obligations within manageable limits. Mr. President, this government seeks to be fiscally conservative and therefore any increase in debt at any level is unwelcome. However, given the twin problems of upward pressure on unbudgeted expenditure caused by high expenditure in healthcare and education and the downward pressure on revenue caused by the closure of our tourism and allied industries, I believe that we can be proud that we kept the increase in total debt to less than 4.4%. As we enter the new fiscal year, my government pledges to work steadfastly and diligently to ensure that Nevis is set firmly on a path to recovery that is both sustainable and inclusive. We will continue to implement timely, targeted, and balanced fiscal policies to support our recovery in our quest to build resilience, stimulate sustainable growth, and ensure an entrenched culture of inclusion. At the moment, the pandemic may have devastated our economy and depleted our resources, but it has also brought to light the true spirit of resilience and determination of the Nivision people. We will continue our efforts at renewable energy development, especially the exploration of geothermal energy, as we believe that this cheaper, cleaner source of energy can be the catalyst to propel our economy forward over the longer term. The Nivision people have heard much about geothermal energy and its promise for well over a decade. My government is committed to delivering this cheaper, cleaner energy with all its attendant benefits, including the potential for export to St. Kitts and neighboring islands in the new fiscal year. Discussions with financiers are finally at an end stage, and we are optimistic that this is now the time for the realization of the promise of geothermal energy. As we turn our attention to investment promotion, it is no secret that the investment climate has become very challenging. It is now obvious that while we can take steps to mitigate the effects of natural disasters, it has proven impossible to mitigate the effects of a health pandemic such as COVID-19. Many hotel properties now lie dormant and devoid of the occupancy levels that will make them profitable. It is therefore imperative that we continue to promote Nevis as a viable place to invest while seeking to diversify our options. We must now look towards investment in agriculture, information technology, light manufacturing, medical research, financial services, and explore new options such as a film industry which offer potential for spurring economic development. Mr. President, I wish to report that my administration is still actively seeking an operator to utilize the Brownhill Communications call center operations, which was handed over to us intact and fully functional by the former operators of the center. We were, in fact, making serious progress early this year but our efforts were derailed by the onset of the pandemic, which prohibited the potential operators from making another visit to Nevis to finalize the operational arrangements. Nevertheless, we will continue our quest to find a suitable operator so as to get our people back to work. In light of the need to be more proactive in the investment marketplace, my administration is presently undertaking a project to revamp our main marketing arm the Nevis Investment Promotion Agency, better known to all of us as NIPA. This revamping exercise will see the launching of a new interactive and user-friendly website platform, encompassing all the features which we hope will pique the interest of investors 
and have the effect of luring them to invest in Nevis. This new digital platform will form the basis for investment in Nevis as all potential investors, both local and international, must first register on this platform, submit their project proposals and other pertinent documents, which will then be reviewed and assessed by the competent staff at NEPA before submission to the cabinet for consideration. It is our intention that NEPA will become the one-stop shop for all investment and be the interface between the investor and the various departments of government, namely the company's registry, the Department of Physical Planning, the Ministry of Finance, and Ministry of Agriculture. This revamping is all in an effort to enhance the investor experience as we seek to increase our ranking in the ease of doing business index. Through this platform, investors will be able to track the progress of their various applications which would have been routed to the various approval agencies of government. Mr. President, one of the main features of this electronic investment platform will be our ability to list all the professional service providers, development concessions offered by government, and the various procedures to be observed when doing business or submitting documents to any of the approved agencies of government. This, we feel, will expedite the approval processes and potential investors will be very clear about the documents to be submitted and the processes to be followed in order to obtain the relevant approvals. The listing of professional services, such as lawyers, architects, surveyors, and project managers, to name a few, will also provide a medium through which our highly trained and qualified persons can market themselves internationally. A second feature of this revamping process is the establishment of the real estate database. My government is quite aware that there are a number of properties on Nevis currently available for sale and of the need to assist our realtors to market these properties internationally. This database, when fully implemented, will allow our realtors the opportunity to list all properties currently available for sale. Mr. President, as an additional feature of this platform, realtors will be able to upload videos and photos of both the internal and external environment of these properties so that potential investors or other interested parties can do their own independent assessment from the comfort of their home and even make purchasing decisions without having to travel to Nevis to view the actual property. It is our hope that this new initiative, which is the first of its kind in the region and comparable only to countries such as Singapore, when completed and launched, during the first quarter of 2021 will become the catalyst for increased foreign investment into Nevis. <coughs> we have always portrayed our country as one of law and order and respect for the rule of law. We are fully aware that there are countries that are currently facing social unrest and instability, resulting in a lack of investor confidence. In response to this, my administration intends to expand our investment promotion drive into such countries as a means to solicit investment into Nevis by people seeking a stable and rewarding environment. My cabinet has already mandated NIPA to specifically target these countries with an enhanced investment pitch as part of our new strategy of looking beyond the traditional investment markets of the USA and Europe and focusing instead on Asia, the Middle East, Russia, and other Eastern European countries. We feel that these are now the emerging areas with potential investors looking to expand their portfolios and opt for less stressful lifestyles. We continue to work closely with the proposed developers of the Rest Haven Inn property, Belmont Development at Pinnies, Spring Air Development, Bush Hill Development, Tamron Cove, the one and only resort, the Apsaras Science and Technology Park, and the Northern Point Wyndham development. We are aware that the onset of the pandemic may have caused some difficulties for these developers, but we are hopeful that these issues can be resolved early in fiscal year 2021 and result in the start of construction activities on these proposed projects in the short to medium term. 
Mr. President, while we look towards foreign direct investment, my administration does not for a moment underestimate the ability of our people to make significant investments that can have a substantial impact on the economic development of our island. We are indeed heartened by the continued local investment in light manufacturing, which supplies input for our construction industry. This is a sector which my government will continue to nurture and seek to further develop over the medium term. We are a resourceful people who can be creative in our thinking, and we should use that as a means of generating business ideas in non-traditional areas. It was in support of this thrust that my administration approached the Taiwanese government for funding in the amount of $5 million and was able earlier this year to successfully launch the small enterprise micro lending project, which is administered by our local SIDU office. In this regard, I am happy to report, Mr. President, that we have already received the first drawdown of funds in the amount of EC $1.9 million. Based on a recent report from the SIDU office, at the end of October 2020, a total of 44 applications have been received for funding, of which 23 applications have been processed and approved, with total funding in the amount of $974,471.31. The remaining applicants are currently going through the review and business counseling process, which is the normal procedure prior to granting approval. The approved loans were disbursed across a variety of sectors, such as food and beverage, services, retail trade, and industry. It is very heartening, Mr. President, to note that of the approved applicants, 56% were female. This is very much in keeping with the objectives of the program to encourage more women and youth to own their own business. I wish to use this opportunity to continue to encourage our people to take advantage of this opportunity to develop viable and sustainable business ideas for funding. Our hardworking staff at CEDU will be quite happy to provide you with assistance to convert your business ideas into successful projects, holding true to their motto of building our economy one business at a time. Mr. President, I turn to tourism and the environment. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a monumental impact on the tourism industry, upsetting last year's projections, just as the tourism sector was poised to have one of the best performing years in 2020. Months of solid bookings had to be canceled as the pandemic spread. Stakeholder earnings and government revenues were drastically depleted due to the border lockdown from March until October 2020. Visitor demand obviously diminished as everyone took a cautious approach to travel due to all of the various international requirements, restrictions, and protocols that have been put in place for travel locally, regionally, and internationally. The tourism outlook for 2021 is still shrouded in uncertainty, but we anticipate that there is still travel demand as COVID-19 weary visitors are seeking travel bubbles that are relatively COVID-19 free. Phase reopening began with franchise establishments such as the Four Seasons Resort Nevis and is gradually extending to other properties. I wish to emphasize that we are being cautious to avoid some of the mistakes made elsewhere, hence the phased approach. Mr. President, the Ministry of Tourism will continue to engage in the Hospitality Assured Program, which is championed by the Caribbean Tourism Organization, CTO, as a vehicle for promoting organizational excellence in the tourism industry. We must congratulate the Wally Beach Resort for recertifying under this program in January of 2020. Our taxi operators and tour guides are critical stakeholders. In August 2020, the Ministry of Tourism conducted a training course for prospective taxi operators and tour guides. 
72 participants completed the course as compared to 40 persons in past years. It must be noted that among the 72 persons, there were 15 females, and the average age of the trainees was 35 years. These are indeed encouraging demographics, which underscore the administration's thrust towards empowering women and youth, inducing them to become more productive and valued members of our society. I am delighted to report, Mr. President, that concrete progress has been made with the Pinnis Park project after more than five years of planning, seeking external funding assistance and negotiating the regulatory requirements, such as the EIA and building approval. Physical works started to date include the construction of the public bathrooms, parking lots, lawn amphitheater, and landscaping, which are being undertaken simultaneously with the construction of the buildings. To facilitate the landscaping process, a nursery was established at Cades Bay to propagate thousands of plants that would be needed for the project. Last week, the project launched the Art in the Park initiative, to which Navision artists were invited to paint their works on the perimeter walls of the site. Work has already begun, and this promises to offer a very pleasing enhancement to the area. We commend the local artists for their contributions. The Pinnis Park project will also bring much needed employment to as many as 50 divisions during the course of construction. We are grateful to our friends from the Republic of China, Taiwan, for their generous contribution of some US $2.7 million for the construction of the park, which is scheduled to be, complete, to be completed by December 2021. When completed, the Pinnis Park will be a landmark achievement of my government for and on behalf of the people of Nevis and will forever cement the close bonds between our people and the Taiwanese people. Mr. President, the NIA continues its commitment to the environment through its support of such initiatives as Plastic Free July, which was also recognized throughout the Federation. One of the activities held was a repurposing plastic competition, which challenged competitors from both islands to make useful and creative products from waste plastic. Three divisions gained places in various categories of the competition. These persons are Mr. Kelleran Leibard, Mrs. Jennifer Leibard, and Ms. Kelsey Leibard. All Leibards, Mr. President. We say heartiest congratulations to the Leibard family for successfully representing Nevis in this competition. The administration will continue to support the drive to eliminate single-use plastics and styrofoam from our island. Mr. President, the Nevis Tourism Authority, our main tourism promotion vehicle, continues to implement an innovative marketing approach which focuses on digital marketing strategy and uniquely creative and effective marketing initiatives. One such initiative is the Tourism Ambassador Program, which forges a unique partnership with an exclusive group of travel advisors, influencers, and journalists. The program has received significant praise and has resulted in an increase in our social media following. Nevis Stories is another new initiative which targets and engages our diaspora with the messaging centered on the theme, urging them to return home frequently as visitors. As part of its digital marketing strategy, the NTA is working on two impactful videos aimed at highlighting Nevis as the island of experiences. These experiences will include travelers being able to go fishing with a division, go to church with a division, or go hiking with a division. In addition, the Find Yourself in Nevis initiative will encompass a health and wellness focus with special attention to all the natural remedies while capturing the natural healing essence of our destination. The introduction of the nevisisland.com initiative provides significant data for the NTA to be more strategic in our overall marketing initiatives. On average this year, the NTA saw 5,556 visitors to their website per month. 
As the NTA website is our critical marketing tool, it must be user-friendly and informative. Hence, our ongoing efforts aimed at revitalizing the NTA website to create a modern website that provides relevant and timely information for our potential visitors. It is our hope that this will also increase bookings for our tourism stakeholders. Mr. President, during the fiscal year 2021, the Nevis Tourism Authority will celebrate 20 years of operation. This provides a perfect backdrop for a brand refresh. We will continue to explore ways of rebranding Nevis as a premier tourist destination. While we seek to promote infrastructural development, we must also seek to protect the environment, especially our forests and our wetlands. To this end, my government has commissioned the operations of a new unit at the Department of Physical Planning whose main objective is to regulate and guide activities in our natural environment, namely our rainforests, national parks, watersheds, and wetlands. To facilitate this, two park rangers have been hired and housed at the newly constructed interpretation center located at Hard Times Gingerland. The center acts as a focal point for information dissemination for the sustainable use of these sensitive ecosystems. It is our intention to make the center fully functional and adequately staffed in the new year. Mr. President, during the fiscal year 2020, my government through the Ministry of Agriculture embarked on a very ambitious mission, the planting of 10,000 trees, both food bearing and ornamentals, designed to make Nevis more environmentally friendly and combat climate change. I am happy to report that despite the setbacks due to the pandemic, we were able to plant roughly 6,000 trees, a 60% success rate for this very ambitious initiative. As we turn now to the agricultural sector, the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic has caused us to face the glaring reality that we must take greater steps towards food security and sustainability. Like many of our Caribbean neighbors, the closure of business activities overseas and the resulting limited operations at our ports highlighted the precarious state of our food supply. The reality is that we have become far too dependent on external providers for our food supply. To this end, my government immediately implemented strategies to incentivize agricultural production. Under our COVID-19 stimulus package for farmers and fishers, we distributed fencing wire, seeds and seedlings, fertilizer, fish pot wire, free of any charge to our farmers and potential farmers, and offered them concessional water rates, spurring efforts to stimulate increased food production. My government was forward thinking in this approach and offered such concessions not only to commercial farmers, but to backyard farmers as well. Likewise, we were able to provide some assistance to our livestock and poultry farmers through our feed distribution program, which took place on July 15, 2020. I wish at this point, Mr. President, to thank the management of the Eastern Caribbean Group of Companies, ECGC, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, who responded promptly and positively to the request from the Ministry of Finance and provided some 825 bags of feed to the value of $26,259 for distribution to our animal farmers during the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. The closure of our hotels meant reduced sales and income for these farmers while still having to maintain their animals. The injection then of this $26,259 was indeed a welcome measure, reducing the maintenance costs for our livestock and poultry farmers. We must keep up this momentum and heightened interest in agriculture. To this end, the Ministry of Agriculture has reestablished the Agriculture Advisory Committee, which is charged with developing plans and programs to stimulate agricultural production here on Nevis. The committee has already identified at least 10 food crops 
that can be cultivated on a sustainable level. These include tomatoes, lettuce, sweet potatoes, squash, bananas, and watermelons. And we are already witnessing significant increases in production of these items since the onset of the pandemic and a renewed interest in agriculture among our people. During the period up to September 2020, a total of 48,563 pounds of food crops were processed at our marketing facility. This is in comparison to the amount of 58,576 pounds processed for the corresponding period in 2019. Again, Mr. President, this reduction is due to the limited operations during the COVID-19 lockdown period. This increased production that we're witnessing this year, however, means that there will be a greater pressure on the agricultural marketing arm of the department to find new sales outlets for our farmers. Efforts must now move beyond the traditional sales in the domestic market to our hotels, restaurants, and supermarkets. We must now seek opportunities overseas to export the produce of our farmers. I am happy to report that the Ministry of Agriculture is already in discussions with their counterparts in Montserrat to have fruits and vegetables from Nevis exported there. This is an excellent opportunity that we must grasp. And I urge our farmers to take note of these new efforts and initiatives and respond accordingly. During the new fiscal year, the Ministry intends to complete work on two new initiatives in support of this increased agricultural production. Work will be completed on the construction of the facility at Prospect to house our walk-in refrigeration units. Likewise, the completion of work at our water storage facility at New River will provide an opportunity for more than 35 farmers in that location to eliminate their dependency on portable water produced by the Nevis Water Department. Mr. President, we continue to import and consume large quantities of animal meat products, such as beef, mutton, pork, and chicken. During the period January to September 2020, a total of 126,350 pounds of meat was processed at our abattoir facility. This is in comparison to the total of 169,616 pounds processed for the corresponding period in 2019. This reduction, again, is due largely to the reduced operations at the abattoir during the second quarter as a result of the COVID-19 lockdown. From these meat products, the department was able to further process 27,122 pounds of value-added meat products, such as smoked ham and chicken, ribs, ground beef, seasoned pork roast, and burger patties. And I'm advised, Mr. President, that they're producing hams for Christmas and that people can place their orders now. Despite all the above efforts at meat processing and the further processing of meat byproducts, we are still not self-sufficient in meat production. In analyzing the data extracted from our customs department, it is very concerning that there is still significant importation of beef pork, chicken, and to a lesser extent, mutton annually. For the period January to October 2020, we imported 32,669 kilograms of beef and beef value-added products, along with 35,327 kilograms of pork and pork value-added products. This shows that there is still a huge potential for our existing farmers to expand the production of livestock to satisfy our increase in demand. My government will continue to incentivize the growth of this sector by making lands at Madden's available to farmers to raise their animals. Mr. President, as we focus on the importation of chicken products into Nevis, we continue to be alarmed at the quantum of imports. In 2018, a total of 498,889 kilograms of chicken-related products were imported, 
reducing to 288,794 kilograms in 2019. During the period January to September 2020, a total of 249,676 kilograms of chicken products was imported into Nevis. Having analyzed this data, my administration through the Ministry of Agriculture has taken the decision to venture full scale into the area of chicken broiler production to fill this huge demand in our local market. We are currently working with the Ministry of Agriculture and St. Kitts to develop a broiler industry so as to reduce the importation of chicken into the Federation. Provision has been made for the construction of a slaughterhouse at Prospect next to the abattoir. Based on our research, we feel justified in this course of action as over the last five years, more than $75 million worth of chicken was imported into and consumed in our Federation. Mr. President, I think that bears repetition. We feel justified in the course of action to develop a broiler industry because over the last five years, more than $75 million worth of chicken was imported into and consumed in our Federation. The strategy would allow for a number of local farmers to undertake the growth of the chickens and then supply the birds to the department slaughter facility for safe and standardized processing of the meat. The Ministry of Agriculture will work with SIDU to secure funding for several persons who will be identified to undertake the growth of these birds as a new area of business. There was an excellent response from both retailers and consumers to the prospect of having healthy and fresh chicken available on the island. Mr. President, I turn my attention now to the financial services sector. This sector continues to be under threat from organizations such as the European Union and the OECD. It is now an undeniable fact that the financial services sector, as we previously knew it, is changing. More and more efforts are being made to ensure that these business entities, which were moving overseas to favorable and low tax jurisdictions, but still operating in other jurisdictions, are now falling into the tax net of the jurisdiction in which their business activities are taking place. This will no doubt hurt our revenue flow, as we have benefited over the years from having these companies incorporated in Nevis and paying incorporation fees, annual returns, and other fees for services provided by our financial services registry. The industry is presently in transition as it relates to tax residency status with existing companies given a grandfathering provision to cover their current operations and tax status up to June 2021. Beyond that period, they will fall into the tax loop either here in the Federation or in the jurisdiction in which they operate. To minimize the effect on our revenues, and also to keep St. Kitts and Nevis in good standing with these regulatory agencies. The Federal Cabinet has approved amendments to the income tax legislation to move in accordance with international standards as it relates to the taxing of entities operating in this sector. Mr. President, I'm happy to report that the first reading of the Income Tax Amendment Bill 2020 took place in the National Assembly on Tuesday, 17 November 2020. We anxiously await the comments from the private sector as they relate to assessing the impact of the amendments on the industry and look forward to the passage of the legislation and the accompanying regulations so as to bring some certainty to taxing policy for entities in this sector. We are, of course, fully aware that these ongoing changes and requirements will redefine the sector. It is our hope that the passing of the amendments to the corporate income tax legislation will bring some certainty that encourages entities to maintain their registrations in Nevis. The uncertainty over the past two years has already manifested itself in a reduction in the annual revenues collected at our financial services department. The revenue collected up to September 2020 stood at $8.2 million as compared to the amount of 9.3 million collected for the same period in 2019. 
However, Mr. President, the Department has seen a slight increase in product registrations for 2020 as compared to the same period for 2019. The total number of entities registered and general insurance companies, insurance brokers, one registered agent applicant, and one money services business applicant. The regulated entities supervised by the department are as follows. Insurance managers, 16. International banks, three. Registered agents, service providers, 47. International insurance brokers, three. Money services business, five. And international insurance companies, 190. Mr. President, we continue to work assiduously on the development and deployment of a state-of-the-art registry portal to allow the electronic registration and filing for corporations, limited liability companies, trusts, and foundations, and related transactions. The successful implementation of this system will enhance the Nevis product and improve the quality and effectiveness of the services that are being provided to our clients. This Corporate Registry Integrated System, or CRIS, will be internet-based, user-friendly, and facilitate online access to approximately 75% of the services that are currently being offered by the department's company's registry. Every effort has been made to ensure that the CRIS portal meets data security control requirements and is compliant with all relevant international standards governing security management, accessing, and monitoring. The department is presently in the testing and soft launching stage of this new system. And it is our intention to work with the developer to have this portal officially launched during the first quarter of 2021. This, Mr. President, is an extremely proud moment for the department, as it is the first time since the inception of the registry over 30 years ago that registered agents will now be able to perform transactions online. The new system will modernize our registry and put us on par with other competitor jurisdictions. Let me go on record to commend the regulator, the registrar, deputy registrar, and all other members of the project team for their leadership, hard work, dedication, and patience in guiding the process to design this modern, user-friendly and efficient registry system. We must also thank the developer, BDO Canada, for their insight, support, and ability to transform the department's vision into reality. I am to advise proudly that our jurisdiction was scheduled to undergo the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force, CFATAF, fourth round mutual evaluation during the period March 23rd to April 3rd, 2020. However, the on-site visit by the CFATAF assessors was postponed due to the travel restrictions imposed by the pandemic. This evaluation is now rescheduled for the first quarter of the new fiscal year 2021. Mr. President, that was not what I was proud about. This is what I'm proud about. On a related note, the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis was removed from the EU's list of non-cooperative jurisdictions in February 2020. I'm also happy to report that we were able to make the case for the successful removal of unsubstantiated and misleading information on Nevis from Volume 2 of the United States Department of State's 2020 International Narcotics Control Strategy Report, which was published in March this year. Mr. President, if I can just deflect for a moment, imagine that we were able to get the United States to change their report. Additionally, in October 2020, the OECD Forum on Harmful Tax Practices confirmed that the amendments that were recently made in this very House to the Nevis Business Corporation Ordinance and the Nevis Limited Liability Company Ordinance in 2018, that they met their requirements. In the new fiscal year, my government will propose amendments to the Nevis International Banking Ordinance and pass legislation to supervise trust and corporate service providers and registered agents. These confirmations by international organizations, along with our own proactive legislative approach, 
demonstrate our commitment to comply with international standards and that we are in alignment with the Financial Services Department's mandate to build Nevis's profile as a responsible and reputable jurisdiction. Mr. President, I now turn my attention to infrastructure. As we turn to our infrastructural development, we continue to make substantial investment in our island's infrastructure, mainly our road network, as we feel that an improved infrastructure can be the catalyst for future economic development. This all forms part of our people-centered approach in our development strategy, as road improvements enhance communities, improve road safety and facilitate trade in goods and services, while providing opportunities for employment and growth in the small business sector. During this fiscal year, despite the setbacks from the global pandemic, we were able to successfully complete construction works on the Brownhill Road and Craddock Road. The improved road network has transformed these two communities. In addition, remedial work was also completed on a number of secondary road networks in areas such as Ramsbury, Hamilton, Fig Tree, Prospect, Braziers, and Cligot. The total amount expended on road network development and maintenance up to October 31st, 2020, stood at $7.7 .7 million. Mr. President, it is no secret that our annual road rehabilitation program year after year is a very large undertaking, consuming tremendous amounts of resources in our capital budget allocation. While we continue to count the cost of these investments, we recognize that the provision of a comfortable road network is a basic responsibility of every government. Therefore, our efforts must now be focused on providing these road improvements in the least costly manner. To this end, my government through the Public Works Department has invested $1.5 million in a road milling machine to enhance the efficiency and effectiveness of our road work rehabilitation program. The acquisition of this machine will provide substantial cost savings to the administration, as we can now easily mill and replace existing road services without the need for heavy excavation work and extended disruptions in traffic flows. Following the acquisition of this machine, a select group of nine persons, ranging from operators, mechanics, and technicians, attended a one-week virtual training course hosted by the manufacturers during the period October 6th through 9th, 2020. Further training sessions are expected to be conducted in a face-to-face -face format by a technician from the company who's expected to visit Nevis over the next few months. Mr. President, for fiscal year 2021, we expect to continue our road improvement and enhancement plan. Our main focus will be the Butler's Road Rehabilitation Project. I'm sure the representative likes to hear that. And the Bart Village Rehabilitation Project Phase 2. This is in addition to work on a number of secondary village roads at Morning Star, Brown Pasture, Taylor's Pasture, River Path, Farms Estate Road Phase 1, Jessup's Village, and Ramsbury along with improvement in our road drainage systems island-wide. We have, Mr. President, allocated the amount of $13 million in our capital expenditure budget for the new fiscal year to fund these proposed works. The heavy and prolonged rainfall experienced during the early part of November highlighted a number of deficiencies in our road drainage structures on the island. Therefore, Included in the $13 million allocated for road works is the amount of $1 million specifically earmarked to correct some of these drainage issues island-wide. In addition, we are hopeful that we can identify and access external funding to complete rehabilitation work on phase two of the island main road project from Cliff Dwellers to the Mount Nevis entrance and from Shaw's Road to Camps Junction in the St. James Parish area. Mr. President, during the new fiscal year, my government intends to commence a feasibility study 
into the expansion and upgrade of our port facilities. Both our airport and our major seaport facility at Long Point, so as to add value and enhance our competitiveness in the region. We have allocated the amount of $500,000 to fund studies at both ports. In addition, Mr. President, we intend to commence a land use feasibility study for development in the southeastern section of the island, stretching from the Long Point area to Indian Castle. We believe that this section of the island, which is presently untouched, is poised for development and can become the new epicenter for development on a scale similar to that seen on the St. Kitts Peninsula development. The study will provide possible options for funding the infrastructure development. We have committed the amount of $500,000 in our budget to facilitate this process. Mr. President, we must pay greater attention to the sustainability of our water supply. With this in mind, the Nevis Water Department commenced the installation and commissioning of the water treatment and filtration plant at the Hamilton Estate Reservoir site in October 2020. The commissioning and training exercise for staff was conducted by technical officers from AdEdge Technology Inc. in association with Lakeshore Engineering, both of Georgia and the United States of America, the company that supplied the system. I am proud, in fact exceedingly proud to report that this commissioning has been completed and an additional 300,000 gallons of water per day is now available to Nevis. We must commend the staff of the Nevis Water Department for their role in the laying of the pipelines, the installation of conduits, and all electrical connections in the water filtration unit pump house ahead of the arrival of the technicians. We continue to thank the Caribbean Development Fund, CDF, for their financial support in funding this project and their patience during the COVID-19 pandemic for the delayed installation and commissioning of the system. Mr. President, in order to maintain the sustainability of our water supply, we must continue to explore new ways to augment our existing water supply through a continuous water drilling program. We will also seek to explore the use of energy efficient desalination systems as an added approach. The implementation of these programs and projects will depend on the availability of the necessary financial resources and are all aimed at building resilience which will positively impact our economy as we seek to rebuild and recover from the devastating economic blow of the COVID-19 pandemic. I turn my attention now to our safety and security. Mr. President, rebuilding our economy not only rests on the implementation of sound economic policies, but also on the confidence in my government to provide for the safety and security of our people. Our zero tolerance for criminal activities and implementation of measures to deter criminal activities, such as the deployment of our CCTV program, are now proven fruitful. The latest statistics as produced by the Nevis Division of the Royal St. Christopher and Nevis Police Force show a 37% reduction in major crimes on Nevis at the end of November 2020 when compared to the same period in 2019. We must, Mr. President, we must commend the efforts of the Police High Command and in particular the officers of the Nevis Division of the police force for their tremendous efforts in this regard. We continue to commit resources to the upkeep of the security forces on Nevis. Each year we allocate the amount of $500,000 in our budget to supplement the federal budgetary allocation for the Nevis division of the police force. This allocation in our annual budget is used to fund the maintenance of the physical infrastructure and provide equipment and vehicles to assist our officers in the fight against criminal activities here on the island of Nevis. Mr. President, in more recent times, the Nevis Island Administration has assumed even greater responsibilities and has carried out major rehabilitation work at all the police stations and police barracks on Nevis. Earlier this month, 
we witnessed the opening of the brand new state-of-the-art police station in Newcastle, majority funded by the NIA. Expenditure to date on this project is in the amount of $5.5 million. During the new fiscal year 2021, we will continue to build out the remaining portion of the CCTV infrastructure program as a means of deterring criminal activity. Mr. President, my government will continue to adopt a people-centered approach in the policies and programs to be instituted over the next fiscal year. During this current fiscal year and being fully cognizant of the devastating effects of the COVID-19 pandemic and the well-being of our people, we implemented a number of people-centered programs to ease the burden on our people. Working with our local commercial banking sector, we were able to assist our people in gaining moratoria on their debt servicing payments, especially for those persons in the hospitality sector who experience a total loss of or drastic reduction in their income. Similarly, my cabinet provided a further direct ease to our people by relaxing the payment enforcement measures at those departments that provide basic utilities, such as electricity and water. Likewise, our special COVID-19 stimulus construction relief package provides tax relief for persons undertaking any form of construction activity with a material cost in excess of $30,000. This relief program had to transfer their accounts to other commercial banks here on Nevis. This abrupt closure of business and the resulting expenses associated with transferring accounts to other banks were obviously unplanned expenses for our people. This provided the impetus for my cabinet to quickly make the decision to provide some relief to those customers by granting a waiver of the stamp duty on the transfer of mortgages during the period October 1st to December 31st, 2020. These new efforts, in addition to our ongoing social programs, are a continued demonstration of the people-centered approach we have adopted in governing the affairs of our island of Nevis. Mr. President, in order to continue to fashion approaches and implement meaningful people-centered programs, we must continue to have reliable data on the dynamics of our population, which naturally changes from year to year. To this end, the Ministry of Finance through our Statistics Department and in collaboration with their counterparts at the federal level, has already launched activities for the 2020-2021 population census exercise. This exercise is a process designed to provide much needed data in relation to the composition and dynamics of our population. This data, when collected, analyzed, and published, will be an essential tool in the planning process to guide the programs and policies of this administration over the medium term. I therefore wish to use this opportunity to encourage everyone to cooperate fully with the enumerators when they come to visit your household. I implore you to provide as much accurate data as possible. I want to emphasize accurate data. Incorrect data will not provide a true reflection of the state of affairs within our economy and will only give rise to bad planning and the implementation of ineffective programs and policies by your government. I wish to assure you that all data collected will be held with a strict level of confidentiality. Mr. President, in further keeping with this people-centered approach to development, we must seek to empower our communities and our constituents so that our people can be well poised to take advantage of opportunities to improve their standard of living. In the new fiscal year, therefore, my government we launch a series of constituency empowerment programs, particularly targeting education and training, skills development, and poverty alleviation. We have allocated the amount of $500,000 in our budget to fund these programs. Our thrust will be to ensure that persons at all levels in the various constituencies benefit from the plans and programs of this government. Let me turn now, Mr. President, to the very important area of education and human resource development. The Ministry of Education continues to hold true to its goal of education for all, embracing change, securing the future. 
The onset of the COVID-19 pandemic during the second term of 2019-2020 school year forced the Ministry of Education to embrace change in an effort to continue the delivery of education to our children. Infusing technology into the delivery of education has now become the new normal thrust upon us by this pandemic. But it is also a defining moment that will now enhance the delivery of education for the future. The introduction of the Microsoft Teams teaching learning platform has been one of the innovative ideas now being utilized for the delivery of teaching and learning instructions. The Ministry of Education has also partnered with our local internet provider Flow to secure access to an additional online educational platform called Flow Study, which provides self-paced work for students. Mr. President, in order to facilitate the delivery of online education in this format, a substantial investment had to be made in our students so as to enable equitable access to the online platform of Microsoft Teams. To this end, the Ministry of Education conducted surveys of households in Nevis to determine the need for internet service and the extent of students' access to internet cable devices in their homes. The surveys resulted in over 50 homes being connected or reconnected with internet services within the three-month free access. This was made possible through a partnership between the government and our local internet providers. Through this partnership, over 300 brand new tablets were loaned to students. This investment made it possible for students to participate in online and virtual classes while we all experience the COVID-19 stay-in-place restrictions. To complement this new revolution in the delivery of education, my cabinet further assisted and responded in a people-centered way to provide relief to those parents who expressed an interest in purchasing their own online learning devices for their children. To this end, Mr. President, we waived all customs duties, taxes, and charges on the purchase and importation of all laptops, tablets, and other online learning devices necessary to facilitate students' online learning process. This waiver was initially granted up to September 2020 and was later extended to the end of this school term. The Ministry of Education continues to work closely with the local COVID-19 task force in enforcing all pandemic protocols in schools. Substantial investment was made to renovate and retrofit all school plant island-wide. In prioritizing the health and safety of our students at the preschool level, it was determined that the Charleston Preschool needed more floor space to effectively accommodate the number of students enrolled. To this end, the Ministry of Education identified and rented additional building space in the St. John's Parish area that property, which is now referred to as the Charleston Preschool Phase 2, was immediately cleaned and retrofitted with all the necessary amenities to make it school worthy. Mr. President, it is no secret that this modified approach in the delivery of education thrusted upon us by the onset of COVID-19 has resulted in major lifestyle changes for teachers, children, and their parents. To the managers of the education system, we must applaud your efforts in ensuring that the strides made in our educational advancement have not been undermined. The long hours spent working out logistics, acquiring and deploying resources to successfully commence a new school year, even in the face of the pandemic, have been duly recognized and must be commended by all of us. We must also empathize with our teachers as this crisis introduced new challenges to an already demanding vocation. Resilience and innovation are indeed the watchwords of your craft as you seek to secure the success and the holistic development of each student. We have every confidence in your capabilities to continue to rise to the challenge as you have proven your gift and your grit in difficulties in the past. To you, the parents and guardians, as the interruptions caused by the COVID-19 crisis threaten to erode the educational progress of our young people, I make the clarion call for you to rally around your children and around those who lack parental support. You must continue to partner with our teachers 
to ensure that students get the support necessary to perform well in this new normal system for the delivery of education. I implore you to engage, to listen, and love your children. As the youths of our nation, they will play a key role as we move onwards in our quest for success. The fate of our nation, even in these difficult times, lies in the careful molding of our children. Mr. President, as we turn our attention now to the all-important area of health care, it must be noted that our public health response to contain the spread of the COVID-19 virus and pandemic has been remarkable. Multi multidisciplinary cooperation and early engagement and guidance from PAHO and CAFA enabled the Ministry of Health and Gender Affairs to successfully undertake and coordinate rigorous preparedness and response mechanisms to this pandemic. The pandemic significantly increased the demand for medical personnel equipment and supplies. Additionally, the social and economic consequences of the crisis have undoubtedly impacted the health and mental well-being of our people and risk deepening some inequalities even further. At every stage, we have ensured that the public was engaged and kept up to date with the provision of health information and disease prevention activities coordinated by our health promotion unit. Early execution of border control measures also resulted in the remarkably low infection rates among our people. These actions were necessary to protect the health and safety of all divisions and were critical to mitigating the spread of the virus. Mr. President, I wish to again recognize the noble contribution of our frontline and essential workers, especially our nurses and doctors in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. In recognition of their sterling contribution, I am happy to report that in June 2020, Cabinet approved an increase in the pay scales for all nurses at both the community and institutional levels as a signal of our gratitude for their undying commitment and effort in combating this invisible enemy. We cannot thank our nurses enough. While this pandemic magnified some deficiencies in our healthcare sector, the lessons learned provided us with an opportunity to restructure and rebuild. We must now focus on capacity as it relates to our human resources, the availability of equipment, medical procedures, and our stock of medical supplies. We had to acquire much needed medical equipment and supplies funded by our limited resources in addition to assistance received from the federal government and donations from PAHO and the foreign allied governments. These items included ventilators, oxygen concentrators, defibrillators, a chemical analyzer, personal protective equipment, PCR testing supplies, and infrared camera systems. We also benefited from the generous contributions of many local and international donors and institutions who supplied us with large quantities of hand sanitizers, masks, and other valuable items. We wish, Mr. President, to thank them all for their generosity during our time of crisis. Mr. President, we will embark on the further integration of technology in the delivery of healthcare. The introduction of telemedicine in the 2020 annual eye care program was a creative way of maintaining continuity of care and doctor-patient support even during this pandemic. We hope to expand this service to other clinical areas in the medium term. The implementation of the hospital information system will encourage innovative use of our technology infrastructure to connect healthcare providers electronically, provide online information access, and facilitate data exchange. We also intend to bolster our diagnostic capabilities with the purchase of additional critical equipment for the laboratory and radiology department and move towards improving coverage of essential medicines and medical supplies. Mr. President, as it relates to our physical healthcare infrastructure, during the new year 2021, we will be entering the critical stage of the Alexandra Hospital Expansion Project. 
The external work on the facility is now substantially complete and attention will be turned to the internal layout of the structure. The internal layout must be properly designed to ensure our healthcare staff have a world-class facility from which to deliver cutting-edge care and meet the changing needs and rising public demand. In preparation for delivery of this improved level of service, my administration has already invested the amount of $176,650 in the purchase and commissioning of two new ambulances for the Alexandra Hospital. We are grateful indeed to the members of the St. Christopher Nevis Social Security Board who have been gracious in providing funding to meet the cost of one of these units. Mr. President, at our community health level, we must commend the efforts of the management and staff of the Nevis Solid Waste Management Authority. We continue to be alarmed at the quantum of garbage generated daily and increasing demand being placed on the officers of that entity to keep our surroundings clean. This demand has increased dramatically since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. In recognition of the increasing demand for services now placed on this entity, my government has taken the decision to allocate all monies collected at our Customs Department for Environmental Levy on importation of vehicles to fund the increasing cost of operation of this entity. My cabinet has also granted approval for increases in the solid waste disposal levy, along with an increase in the tipping fees payable for the disposal of waste at the solid waste disposal site, as outlined in our fiscal measures, to provide additional funding for the operations of this entity. I turn now, Mr. President, to our youth. The Department of Youth remained resilient in its quest to engage in activities that will positively impact the youths of Nevis. In recognition of International Youth Day and in celebration of youth excellence, the department hosted the Youth Impact 12 Awards Ceremony, which featured six young persons recognized for their sterling contributions in areas of national importance. The 25 Most Remarkable Teens Program also featured eight teens of Nevis being awarded for their positive, positive impact, I'm sorry, on youth development. Mr. President, for the upcoming fiscal year 2021, the department intends to take steps to further regulate the operations of all youth serving and youth-led groups and organizations and to celebrate and recognize outstanding youth practitioners. Additionally, efforts will persist as it relates to the resuscitation of the Nevis Youth Council, which is the formal board of Nevision youth that provide representation of the youth voice in this community. This process will be guided with technical support from our regional partners. Mr. President, we continue to make great strides in developing programs for the rehabilitation of our at-risk youth. I am happy, in fact, I'm more than happy, to report that on Tuesday, October 22, 2020, we witnessed the official opening of our YTS, Yes to Success, Skills Training and Diversion Center at Pinnis. This project was jointly funded by the Organization of American States, USAID, and the Nevis Island Administration through the Department of Social Services at a cost of $250,000 inclusive of the tools and equipment to facilitate the training. As the name implies, this center is meant to provide an opportunity to re rehabilitate our at-risk youth and equip them with skills and training necessary to seek gainful employment or even become self-employed business persons. I am very pleased at the effort to date to steer these young persons into an alternative path. I am indeed happy to report that the center has been functional for the past few months, and at least 70 persons have already benefited from training at this center in the areas of pottery making, heavy equipment operations, and digital media. In the new fiscal year, it is our intention to expand the array of skills training offered at the center so as to reach a wider cross-section of our at-risk youth. Mr. President, the successful operation of this training center is part of our ongoing effort to tackle criminal activities on Nevis. I am very pleased to report that the OECS consultants who were assigned to this project 
have already approved this center as a diversion site that could be used by the juvenile justice system in St. Kitts and Nevis for rehabilitating our youths. Mr. President, a quick look at housing. The housing revolution, which we are now experiencing on Nevis, is one of the measures that my government has implemented to increase the standard of living of our people. We will continue to incentivize this revolution through our duty-free concessionary first-time homeowners program, which has served to drastically reduce the cost of construction. It is no secret that the demand for housing is now far outweighing the rate at which the Nevis Housing and Land Development Corporation can supply. We are fully aware that there are a number of citizens who have the financial security of stable, good-paying jobs, who can meet the requirements of the lending agencies. However, many others are less able to meet the reality. Nevertheless, I must commend the efforts of the commercial banking sector to date, as we are now seeing much reduced interest rates, as low as 5%, being offered on mortgage loans through their various housing programs. But more can be done. We trust that our lending institutions will rise to the challenge. The NHLDC, private lending institutions, and private contractors each play distinct roles in giving momentum to this housing revolution. It is our intention to continue to incentivize the sector during the new fiscal year, as it is yet to achieve its fullest potential. In addition, it is one of the sectors that can contribute significantly to economic development while maintaining the protocols established for fighting the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. President, during this fiscal year, despite the disruptions in daily activities due to the onset of the pandemic, the Housing Corporation was able to undertake construction work on a total of 20 houses at a total cost of $4.88 million. This therefore brings a total number of houses constructed by NHLDC for the period 2013 to 2020 to 189 houses at a total cost of $42.7 million. The goal of the Housing Corporation for the new fiscal year is to promote, build, and distribute no less than 40 affordable houses to applicants with all the amenities. Mr. President, I turn now to fiscal measures and fiscal projections for 2021. As we turn to our fiscal measures for the new budget period, the objectives of my administration will focus on the rebuilding of our economy in the post-COVID-19 era, with emphasis on the general health and well-being of our people. We will continue to take steps to reduce government spending and incentivize the private sector to be the engine of growth through our various programs to attract foreign direct investment while encouraging the growth of the small business sector. My government therefore aims to present a budget for this fiscal year 2021 that is free of any new taxes as a post-COVID-19 incentive to stimulate economic expansion and encourage growth. We will continue to extend our existing fiscal incentive programs such as the First Time Homeowners Program, which is designed to stimulate growth in the construction sector. Our program for concessions for startup businesses, along with our program for concessions for entities operating in the tourism sector. The concession package extended to our returning nationals and also our program to facilitate the movement of skilled persons into our island will continue. It is our hope that the persons who would receive concessionary benefits under these programs will seize the opportunity to make meaningful contributions to the growth and development of our economy. In addition, we will extend our COVID-19 relief construction stimulus package for an additional three months up to March 31st, 2021. This program, which was initially implemented in September 2020, provided relief for residents undertaking any form of construction activity with materials costing in excess of 30,000 being required to pay only the 17% value added tax on those materials. This program was to complement our existing ongoing first time homeowners program. And let me be clear, Mr. President, construction must be commenced by March 31st, 2021. 
Let me say that again. Construction must be commenced by March 31st, 2021, if you want to take advantage of this very generous concession package for, for constructing homes. We will also, Mr. President, extend our policy of the waiver of alien land holding license fees for an additional three months up to March 31st, 2021. This policy, which was initially implemented in September 2020, provided a waiver for the payment of the alien land holding license fee for all non-nationals wishing to purchase existing properties, specifically land and buildings. It is not applicable to the purchase of undeveloped land. So for those who want to buy a plot of land, they will not get this benefit. The idea is for those who are buying building and land, house and land, building and land, they get the benefit. Similarly, after consultation with our realtors and in an effort to expedite sales of existing properties here on Nevis, approval has been granted for purchasers of any existing property in excess of US $400,000 to qualify for citizenship under our citizenship by investment program. We would like to publicly thank the federal government for agreeing to this proposal put forward by my government. Mr. President, it is hoped that the stimulus measures outlined above will stimulate activities in our real estate and construction sectors and provide employment. We will continue to take steps to boost the growth of our revenues by continuously reviewing and amending our existing schedule of fees to ensure that they are at a level comparable to the cost of delivering the associated services. To this end, our cabinet has approved the form of any of these critical services. Relevant legislation. Cabinet policies are when necessary to be used as a short-term tool to drive the long-term benefits of increase in business activity ultimately leading to an increase in employment opportunities for our people. We shall, Mr. President, discontinue the random policy of granting duty-free concessions on vehicles simply because someone is the holder of a business license. Concessions now would only be favorably considered where the vehicle palms part of the business activity. The deciding test will be whether or not in the absence of the vehicle, the core functions of the business cease to exist. We shall strengthen our property tax collection framework as this tax continues to underperform and many persons continue to fall outside the property tax net. Mr. President, we will continue to make a concerted effort to persuade our people to be responsible citizens and to honor their tax obligations. To this end, we will continue to enforce our existing policy whereby all persons or entities seeking to contract for the provision of goods or services to the government must be current with their payment of all fees and taxes or must have made suitable arrangements for the payment of their taxes before entering in, into such contracts. In addition, such entities which are in default of a suitable payment arrangement will not be allowed to renew their business license or transact other business activities with the Inland Revenue Department until these matters are seriously addressed. It is only fair that as business entities seek to benefit from the economic engagement with the administration, that they must pay their share of fees and taxes to allow the government the resources to further fund critical programs. We therefore encourage all taxpayers to file and pay their taxes on time. All of us, all of us must be responsible citizens. Mr. President, times are difficult now and likely to get more difficult before they get better. As an initial short-term measure to align our expenditure with our projected revenues for the new fiscal year, my cabinet has approved the implementation of the following expenditure reduction measures with effect from January 1st, 2021. One, the temporary suspension of overseas travel for all public servants, including members of cabinet, unless these travels are fully funded by third parties. Two, the reduction of the monthly travel allowance payable to all public servants, including members of cabinet, by 50%. Three, the temporary suspension of the payment of increments 
to all civil servants. Four, the deferral of any requests for promotion of officers or upgrade of their salaries and wages. In addition, we will defer the employment of any new officers to the public service. Where officers have exited the service, we must first seek to reorganize duties among existing staff before employing replacement officers. These short-term, and I emphasize short-term measures, will have an immediate impact on our fixed monthly commitments, bringing them within reasonable limits as we await the economic recovery in our main sectors. Therefore, Mr. President, the budget for the upcoming fiscal year is set at $237.2 million. We have allocated the amount of $174.9 million to recurrent spending, representing 73% of the total budgeted expenditure. Having considered the uncertain negative impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, my administration is projecting collection of $128.2 million in recurrent revenue, which represents a projected decrease of 8% when compared to the projected revenue of $139.5 million for fiscal year 2020. We expect our recurrent revenue to be augmented by the remittance of at least $45 million from the federal government, representing a share of revenue from the CBI program. Our combined total recurrent revenue is therefore projected at $173.2 million for the upcoming 2021 fiscal period. And when compared to the projected recurrent expenditure of $174.9 million, provides a deficit under a current budget of $1.7 million. Mr. President, the amount of $62.3 million has been allocated for the funding of our capital expenditure program. This represents a 10.2% reduction when compared to the amount of $69.4 million that was allocated for the fiscal year 2020. This is largely due to my administration's policy to be conservative in our spending over the medium term and in response to the anticipated reduction in revenue collection for the upcoming fiscal year. We anticipate that funding for our capital budget will comprise of loan funding where applicable from the St. Kitts and Nevis Social Security Board, the Sustainable Growth Fund, grant funding from the Government of China, Taiwan, along with other grant funding from our regional and international partners. In addition, my administration will seek loan funding from other financial entities at concessionary rates not exceeding 4% per annum to complete the financing of these capital works. Therefore, Mr. President, a summary of resources projected to finance our 2021 expenditure program is outlined as follows. Current revenue, $128.2 million. Projected minimum revenues from CBI passport processing fees, $45 million. Social Security loan and other concessionary loans, $21.4 million. Government of China, Taiwan funding and other grant funding, $10.8 million. While we have made these projections, Mr. President, I want to be very clear that we intend to be very strict with the collection of revenues and will seek to reduce revenue losses by curbing our open-ended concession policies. I wish to reiterate that annual budgets are merely projections for revenue and expenditure. The extent to which we roll out expenditure will naturally depend on our ability to access funding especially for executing the items as outlined in our capital expenditure program. I wish to assure the public that we will not be reckless in our spending and we will only seek to undertake projects if the funding is available or can be accessed at low cost in accordance with our debt management strategy. Where funding cannot be accessed at concessionary rates, we will curtail our expenditure program and carry forward to fiscal year 2022 any projects which were not executed due to a lack of approved financing. Mr. President, the major allocations in our expenditure are as follows. The Office of the Premier is allocated funding in the amount of 7.7 .7 million, representing 3.2% of the total budget. Included in this amount are funds allocated to support the security services in our fight against criminal activity. The Ministry of Finance is allocated funding in the amount of $80.6 million, 
representing 33.9% of the total budget. Included in this amount are funds allocated to meet our debt servicing obligations. The Ministry of Communications and Works is allocated funding in the amount of $34.2 million, representing 14.4% of the total budget. Included in this amount are funds allocated for our infrastructure development program, namely the upgrading of our road network, maintaining of government buildings, and other structures along with provisions for upgrading our water services. The Ministry of Agriculture is allocated funding in the amount of $12.6 million, representing 5.3% of the total budget. Included in this amount are funds allocated for our food sustainability and security, disaster mitigation, and upgrading of our processing facilities. The Ministry of Health and Gender is allocated funding in the amount of $35.6 million, representing 15% of the total budget, including this amount of funds allocated for providing improvements in the quality and delivery of health care, an increase in the remuneration for our nurses, along with the completion of construction work under the Alexandra Hospital Expansion Program. The Ministry of Education, Library Services and Information Technology is allocated funding in the amount of $34.2 million, representing 14.4% of the total budget. Included in this amount are funds allocated for the delivery of quality education to our people, executing work under the CDB TVET Enhancement Program and general maintenance of our educational facilities. The Ministry of Social Development, Culture, Youth and Sports is allocated funding in the amount of $16.1 million, representing 6.7% of the total budget, including this amount of funds allocated for the delivery of our social protection agenda and improvements to our sporting facilities. Mr. President, I come now to what everybody was awaiting, the conclusion. In summary, the fiscal year of 2020 began on a high note with reasonable expectations for continued economic growth. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic has triggered an unprecedented global recession that has left no corner of the globe unscathed. This health crisis with its accompanying challenges has brought about tremendous disruptions in every aspect of our lives. Across the world, more than 1.5 million persons have lost their lives. More than 62.5 million persons have fallen victim to the virus. Labor markets have been gravely disrupted, resulting in an unprecedented rise in unemployment rates. Supply chains have been interrupted. Demand for goods and services has drastically fallen, and productivity and output levels have significantly decreased. Many families suffered through both voluntary and involuntary separation due to lockdown and quarantine measures. Schools have been closed and many of the social norms and activities that are vital for social cohesion have been curtailed. Further, it must be noted that the asymmetrical nature of these outcomes means that middle-income developing countries such as ours here in St. Kitts and Nevis and other emerging markets will bear a disproportionate share of the cost of this pandemic as we lack the finances, infrastructure, and technology needed to carry out vital activities to effectively support our economies. Mr. President, many governments across the globe, including us here in St. Kitts and Nevis, were forced to respond to this crisis by implementing significant fiscal measures in order to cushion the effects on its people. These measures include bolstering and supporting income loss, expanding our social safety net programs to ensure that the most vulnerable are protected, and working with financial institutions to provide credit, support, and relief for individuals and businesses. Moreover, Mr. President, this crisis has allowed us to carry out an objective and decisive evaluation of our food security, health education, and technological infrastructure. We had to quickly identify both human and financial resources that could be effectively used to put infrastructure in place to mitigate the economic and social effects of this crisis. As such, I am confident in declaring that we have learned a great deal from this experience and that we are in a much better position now to deal with a similar pandemic of this nature. Mr. President, it is expected that the mitigation measures that have been put in place to prevent the widespread effects of COVID-19 will remain in place for some time into 2021 
as developed countries are now witnessing a second wave of this virus that may ultimately result in further lockdowns. It is hoped that during the fiscal year 2021, a credible vaccination program will be in place and that transmission rates across the globe will be on the decline, thereby permitting life and work to once again resemble that of the pre-pandemic era. Despite our positive approach to the new fiscal year, we anticipate soft demand, a reduction in remittances, a weak travel and tourism sector, reduced foreign capital flows, and a potentially stagnant job market. Thus, we are compelled to build measures into this budget to minimize these effects. The crisis has significantly reduced our tax base, and therefore our spending measures, as outlined in this budget, are targeted towards initiatives that will support sustainability in the near term, with a focus on agriculture, health, education, and the financial services, and the construction sector, the environment, and income-generating cost savings infrastructural projects. We all look forward to the end of this crisis and a return to some level of normalcy. Mr. President, the cabinet which I am privileged to lead pledges to be creative and resolute in managing the affairs of our island, especially during this difficult time in our history. We anticipate that some difficult days still lie ahead as the global community tries to turn the corner on this pandemic. As your people-centered government, we ask you, our people, to keep the faith, to continue to support your government as together we will work hand in hand to overcome these difficulties. Together we will work to build a better and brighter Nevis for ourselves and for future generations. Thank you again for the faith and confidence you have placed in my government. This Christmas season, let us all express our profound gratitude and be contented with what we have. On behalf of the cabinet, I wish you a happy Christmas and a new year filled with hope and confidence as we partner with you in rebuilding our economy. Mr. President, Nevis is on the right track and we will not be derailed. I therefore urge our people to keep the momentum. Mr. President, I so move. Mr. President, I rise and seek your leave for the adjournment of this honorable house until 10 a.m. tomorrow, December, Wednesday, December the 9th. Mr. President, I rise to second the motion. Let me, at this juncture, indicate that the time that the Minister for Finance took, he started at 11.15 and it ended at 1.15. So, uh, the member opposite has two hours in which to make her presentation, and um, that is section 40 in the National Assembly Ordinance, subsection five, and the second, from the second line of that indicate exactly how, uh, how much time you do have. This Honorable House Stand adjourned until tomorrow, 9th December at 10 a.m. House adjourned.